start. They are doing some AP testing on campus. Very, very little of it, but some. That's why our belts have been turned off. So let's go ahead and look at today's handout. Now this handout is actually for today and Thursday, which is why it's so long. Also the questions are really spaced out so that it doesn't feel cramped on there. But together, all of these pages will make up handout 115. And on the front page, there is a big box where we are going to put all of our notes and then the rest of it is just practicing a bunch of questions so let's go ahead and start with the three that we talked about last class which was x-intercepts versus vertical asymptotes versus holes so I reminded you of those last class so that this wouldn't feel like it was as much information <clears throat> but truthfully, once you practice all of these questions, all like 14 or 15 of them, um, it, you should be feeling pretty confident by then. So, Okay, so what I'd like you to do for your notes here is you're welcome to copy down exactly like I'm going to copy down. Or um, if you prefer to reword it or make it more detailed, or later on if you want to go back and add some details to it, then that is highly encouraged. But just starting with the three we've already reviewed in this class, which was x-intercept, and this occurs for any x values that make only the numerator equal to zero. Keyword there is only. Vertical asymptotes occur for any x values that make only the denominator equal to zero. Keyword there was only because if it makes the numerator and denominator zero then it is no longer an x-intercept nor is it a whole or I mean a vertical asymptote and said it would be a whole. Holes occur for any x values that make both the numerator and denominator equal to zero. So those underlined highlighted parts there make them unique. If x equals three is an x-intercept, it cannot be a vertical asymptote or a whole. If it's a vertical asymptote, it can't be an x-intercept or a whole. It can only be one of these three things at a time. Now for holes, we will also have to find its y value. So last class we talked about to find the y value, you're going to plug in the x value. Of the whole into the reduced fraction. Now I'm putting this one in a different color because that's one that tends to not stick as well with students. What you guys are going to see when we start looking at these questions down here is question one might have an x-intercept, but then the next two or three questions may not have x-intercepts. So it, you know, you don't get to practice every one of these things every single question, which is why you have to practice a lot of them to make sure that you practice each skill a few times. So this is what I think happens with the holes. Only every three or four questions are going to have a hole. Um, so you just don't get to practice finding the y value as much. But, okay, so what I'd like to do <clears throat> is with these three things under our belt, again, feel free to reword this later or make it more detailed later. But I'd like to go ahead and just answer questions one and two with these values and put that information on the graph. And then we'll go back and talk about some new stuff. Okay, so for questions one and two, um, to find x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, and holes, we need to know what numbers make the numerator 
zero and what numbers make the denominator zero. So sometimes, like question two, if nothing needs to be factored, then that should be pretty much instant. Over here, question one, the numerator one never equals zero. But the denominator, sometimes you're gonna have to do some factoring. So factor out a GCF of three, factor your trinomial, all so that you can set each one of these factors equal to zero. So sometimes it's a little bit less work than others, but we need to know what numbers make the numerators and denominator zero. So any number that makes just a denominator zero is how you get vertical asymptotes. And those are vertical lines, so you need to write them as x equals. And for all of our asymptotes, we're going to graph those as dashed lines. So x equals 2, x equals negative 3, and x equals 4 for questions 1 and 2. These asymptotes are going to help us with our graph quite a bit. Okay, for x-intercepts, that's going to be for any number that makes just a numerator 0. So that is a point if you have to make a table, but a point also for our graph. Over here, no value made the numerator 0, so that means that there are not any x-intercepts. But don't leave that blank blank, because then it just looks like you don't know when you skipped it. And of course, I can't plot any x-intercepts if they didn't have any. <clears throat> and then holes have to be x values that make both the numerator and the denominator 0. And that doesn't happen in questions 1 or 2. OK, so these are the three that we kind of introduced last time. You guys OK with those three? Anything jumps out at you you want to ask before we pile on a couple more things. Okay. All right. Um, what I would say is probably the next easiest would be y-intercept. So to find a y-intercept, plug in 0 for x, just like all algebra stuff. Plug in 0 for x and solve for y. Okay, and then let's go ahead and do that for questions 1 and 2. So if I plug in 0 for x on question 1, I get 1 over 0 plus 0 minus 18. So that would be negative 1 18th. Very easy to compute even without a calculator. And then question 2, plug in 0 for x, we get negative 2 over negative 4, which reduces to 1 half. So for both of these questions, we now have a new point. We should go ahead and add those to our graph. All right. And then back up to the notes. So some of the most amount of space we're going to need to spend is horizontal asymptote. So we actually reviewed these just a few weeks ago when we were doing limits, because to do infinite limits, as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, you're basically just applying horizontal asymptote rules. So for this, you have to know to compare the degrees of the numerator and denominator. And then there's three scenarios that could happen, either the degree of the numerator could be bigger or the degree of the denominator could be bigger or the degrees could be equal 
three possibilities. So when the degree of the numerator is bigger, you do not have a horizontal asymptote, unfortunately, because that helps us with our graphs quite a bit. If the degree of the denominator is bigger, it's y equals zero. And when the degrees were equal, it will be y equals leading coefficient of the numerator over leading coefficient of the denominator. Again, after a while, feel free to reword those or make them more detailed or add some examples out to the side. This box is really uh, for you to have one place to refer to all of the notes. Okay, so if we apply these rules to questions one and two. Question one, the numerator has a degree of zero because there's no x's, and has, the denominator has a degree of two. So when the degree of the denominator is bigger, your horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Now that's another type of asymptote, so we should graph it as a dashed line also. And then in question two, looks like the degrees are equal. So leading coefficient over leading coefficient would be one over one. So question two, the horizontal asymptote is y equals one. So graph that dashed line. So horizontal asymptote, like uh, many of these things, if you know those rules, just like I did those two questions, usually you can just go straight to the answer. Don't need a bunch of work, but if you don't know the rules, then you're just kind of guessing and hoping that it works out. Okay, probably the one that's the biggest pain, but luckily most of these won't have a slant asymptote, um, also known as oblique asymptote, if that's how you were told in algebra two. Gener this is kind of like a regional thing. I think most of America calls them slant asymptotes, and then most of the rest of the world calls them oblique asymptotes, but same thing. So because these are a pain, you really want to start off knowing when it's even going to have one, because most of the time it's not going to have one. The only time you're going to have a slant oblique asymptote is when the degree of the numerator is one bigger and the degree of the denominator. So if the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator, we can say it doesn't have a slant asymptote and we can move on. But when it does, what we will have to do, the how we find it, is we will have to do long division and it will be y equals whatever the quotient is. So if there's a remainder, we can ignore it. The remainder has no impact on the slant asymptote. Okay, so let's look at questions until we find one that has that so that we can look at it and uh, Make sure we do one of those together at the beginning. Probably should have done the same thing with holes, but we did do that together last time. So, question one, the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator, so there is no slant asymptote. Question two, the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator, so no slant asymptote. But if we look at question three, the degree of the numerator is three, the degree of the denominator is two, so that's five seconds. You should know there is a slant asymptote, meets the requirements, but finding the equation is, this one's gonna be um, a little more time consuming. We have to do long division. One of the reasons we reviewed this recently 
And to be fair, uh, on this worksheet, a lot of our long division is going to have some fractions in it, and generally that doesn't happen, but it's okay. It's good practice for you. So to do this, um, I would do this in three steps. This makes this a lot easier to do without a calculator. I'm going to say that this first part should be negative because a negative times a negative gives me a positive. I'm going to say that I need an x because x times x squared gives me x cubed. And then the third part, what number can I multiply by 3 to get 1? 1 third. Good. Multiplying by a third is the same as dividing by 3. So if you do it in three steps like that, it's not too bad. Okay, then you also have to multiply to this. Negative times negative is positive. One third times three would be one, and x times x would be x squared. And then multiply it to the 18. Positive times negative. 18 times a third, again, that's like divide by three times an x. And then change all of these signs and add. And then if you can go again, then you need to go again. So next up, we got to figure out what times negative 3x squared gives us negative 2x squared. So again, do it in three parts. I would say that it, this needs to be positive because a positive times a negative gives me a negative. I'm going to say I don't need any more x's because I've already got x squared and I want x squared. But the number I could multiply by 3 to get 2 well, if we multiply by one third, we talked about that's like dividing by three, so that would give me one x squared. So if I want it to be twice as big, make it two thirds. Just double this. Now, this times this gives me this. If I multiply it to this, positive times a negative, two thirds times three, times x and then times this. 18 times 2 thirds is like 18 divided by 3 which would be 6 times 2 which would be 12. I'm going kind of fast here at the end but the reason why is because at the very end it doesn't matter. For slant asymptotes it's only the quotient that matters. If there's a remainder left over, it does not impact the slant asymptote. So again, that one's a little bit harder than normal because usually you don't have to do deal with fractions, but because the degree of the numerator was one bigger than the degree of the denominator, it had a slant asymptote, and that's how we have to go about finding it. Long division, y equals whatever the quotient is. Okay, any questions about my long division work or any of that? Okay, then it sounds like we got just one more thing to fill in on our little note box at the top here, and then we can finish questions one and two, and I'll tell you how the graph behaves around those asymptotes. And then we can start practicing all of the questions. And I'll be with you for the first few, and then I'll ask you to start doing some guided practice so that you can start seeing which ones you understand and which ones you don't understand. But the last piece we need in here is domain, and just like all other math stuff, this is a good way to describe the x values of a function and or his graph. So basically what x values make sense for that function. Okay. So I'm actually going to do domain after we have the graphs because I think it's quite a bit easier once you have the graphs. It's not terrible at first, but... Okay, so you need to know two things about how these graphs interact around asymptotes. 
around vertical asymptotes, this is going to be a vertical spike in the graph, which means on one side it's going to go to infinity and one side it's going to go to negative infinity. That always happens for the vertical spikes, the vertical asymptotes. For horizontal asymptotes and slant asymptotes, those tell you what are happening at the ends of the graph. Now, sometimes you're going to need more points. Like on question one, we naturally only have this one point. We only found the y-intercept because it didn't have an x-intercept and we just didn't find any other points yet. So, in this case, I would say it's probably required that we find another point or two. Now, don't try to figure out when x equals 10. That's going to be really hard to compute without a calculator. Plus 10 is off the graph anyway. Pick something easy, like maybe, uh, I don't know, x equals 1. Plug 1 into the function everywhere you can, and see that you get negative 1 twelfth. Also super small, but not quite as close to um, 0 as that one. I think I probably need another point, so I'm going to pick like maybe negative 2 and see if I can pull that one off. Let's see, 6 minus 18 would be negative 1 12. It's also negative 1 12. So I don't think we're going to need more points on question two. I really do feel like we need some more points on question one, which is why I went and found a couple more. There's nothing special about x equals zero or x equals, well, x equals zero, yes, but x equals one, x equals negative two. But even if you don't need more points, sometimes it's not a bad idea to go ahead and get some more points because it's going to uh, increase your confidence in what's going on in this question. <clears throat> okay, so here's the rest of the graph because all of this is going to come together very quickly now. We've got enough points. Based on these I can see that this is going up just barely and then back down but I've got the direction of my function now. So from here to here it's going down so I can assume it's still going down and at all vertical asymptotes it goes to negative infinity on one side and positive infinity on the other side. Same thing with this vertical asymptote. Based on this, I can see it's heading down. And if he heads down on the left, he's going to head up on the right. And then the last thing that we need is to know that it has to approach slant asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes at the very right of the graph and the very left of the graph. So you can see, you don't need a million points if you know how it behaves around those asymptotes. The rest, you kind of have to know the shape of it, the direction of it, which is why I needed an extra point or two, but then the rest kind of fell into place. Now to completely finish question one, let's go ahead and answer the domain. So now that we've got the graph here, we can see which x values we're skipping. <clears throat> so I can see that I'm hitting all of these x values which would be negative infinity to negative 3. And then I hit all of these x values, which is negative 3 to positive 2. And then I hit all of these x values, which is 2, and then forever to the right. So the only numbers that you should be taking out of the domain are numbers that give you division by zero. Whether that's division by zero to make a vertical asymptote or division by zero to make a hole, they have to be taken out of the domain. <coughs> Those are the x values you can't plug in. Okay, over to question two. Let's go ahead and finish this graph. This one, again, you're welcome to do more points. The more points you do, the more confident you're going to feel about your graph. But I think we actually have enough points on this one because I've already got two, and so I know those are connected. 
and then I can see the graphs going down, so he must go down on the left side of the vertical asymptote and up on the right side of the vertical asymptote. And then for all horizontal and slant asymptotes, it tells you what your graph approaches on the far left and the far right. As x approaches negative infinity and positive infinity, what does the graph get closer to? Okay, and then now we can see the domain a little bit better. I need to hit all of these x values. Always put the smaller number on the left. So negative infinity to 4. And then all of these x values. 4 to infinity. Okay. Now let's go ahead and finish question three, but now it will be a little bit different approach, of course, because now we've talked about all of the parts. So what I would do in question three, and what I'm gonna suggest highly to you in question four, is looking at this, go ahead and just start with whichever of these you think are the easiest. I think one of the easiest is y-intercept, so I would do that. Plug in zero for x, solve for y, you get 0 minus 0 minus 0 divided by 0 minus 0 over 18. 0 divided by 18 is going to be 0. That gives me a point for my table, which you guys know we often ask you to do on a test. And there's a point on the graph. As you saw from questions 1 and 2, you don't normally need a ton of points, so any point is a good sign. Okay, what I would probably do next is realize that x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, and holes, we need to know what numbers make the numerator zero and what numbers make the denominator zero. So I'm going to factor the numerator. Looks like he has a GCF and a trinomial. And then I'm going to factor the denominator he also has a GCF and a trinomial. Now I guess this kind of goes without saying, but be careful with your factoring. Yesterday during zero hour, maybe it was Friday during zero hour, I don't remember. Um, of my other class, I had misfactored one of these questions and then I basically had to start it all over because so much of my stuff was wrong that I had just very misleading. But now that the numerator is factored, I can set this equal to zero and solve, this equal to zero and solve, and this equal to zero and solve. So three numbers make the numerator zero. Do the same thing with the denominator. Negative three never equals zero, but x plus three equals zero at negative three, and x minus two equals zero at positive two. And then any number that makes just a denominator zero are vertical asymptotes. Any number that makes just the numerator zero are x-intercepts. And any number that made both zero would be a whole. So it's a lot of work to get one of those three answers, but then once you do the work for one of them, the other two are mostly done. Why should I have known this point already? Right, so the origin is not just a y-intercept, the origin is also an x-intercept. So it's good to see that both those showed up. But for our graph where you've got two new points, and two new asymptotes, Also, we have this asymptote from earlier. We didn't graph. But all asymptotes should be graphed as dashed lines. This one is in MX plus B format. So y-intercept of 2 thirds. Let's just go ahead and throw it on the graph. And a slope of negative 1 third. Z 
So this asymptote should be at a slant, which is why it's called slant asymptote. Okay, if we think about horizontal asymptote rules, we've got to compare the degree of the numerator to the degree of the denominator. The degree of the denominator is bigger, it's y equals zero. If the degrees are equal, it's leading coefficient over leading coefficient. But in this question, the degree of the numerator is bigger, so it does not have a horizontal asymptote. By the way, I'm not going to dwell on this very much, but this comes up a lot in like trivia questions, math contest type questions. If you pay attention to the definition of a horizontal asymptote and the definition of a slant asymptote, you should see that it's not possible to have both of those at the same time. A function could have neither of them, but if it has a slant, it can't have a horizontal. If it has a horizontal, it can't have a slant. Those definitions uh, overlap a little bit. Okay, and of course we could get more points, but on this one, I think we've got enough points if we know how it behaves around the asymptotes. So, for example, I know it's supposed to approach horizontal and slant asymptotes at the end of the graph. So if it's hitting this point and it's got to approach that line, that's going to look like that. From right to left, it looks like the graph's going up, so it's going to continue to go up. So on our first vertical asymptote here, he's going up on the right and down on the left. which is actually good because then it lets me get to this point pretty easily that I was sure about. And he's going up from right to left, so it's going to continue to go up. But he must turn around to get to this other point that I got. By the way, this is where if you miss some of those blanks at the top, like if you miss this x-intercept, then your graph gets really confusing because you don't understand why it's got to turn back around. But now on this vertical asymptote, it looks like it's going down on the right, so up on the left. And then just like it has to approach the slant asymptote on the far right of the graph, it has to approach the slant asymptote on the far left of the graph. So I didn't need any additional points. I think I had all that I needed there. Okay, and then to finish off question three, now that we've got the graph in front of us, we can see the x values it's hitting, so it's a little bit easier to describe the domain. All of these x values would be negative infinity to negative 3. All of these x values would be negative 3 to 2. And all of these x values that it's hitting are 2 to infinity. You don't have to have the graph to do the domain, but it is a little bit easier. Okay, and of course we already did slant. So before I give you a few minutes and ask you to try question four so that you can start learning from your mistakes and such, is there anything about three that jumps out at you? Any of those rules you want me to repeat? Anything specific that you know you're gonna ask about later anyway? Then let me give you five minutes to qu try question four, which I don't know if it's going to be enough time. It's probably not. But on question four, go ahead and start off with a couple that you think are the easiest, the ones you're most confident on. Then do the ones you're a little bit less confident on. And try to not go straight to your notes on the front page. But at some point you need to, and that's okay. Use your notes as much as you need to on question four, but then we're gonna to try to use them less on question five, and then use them less on question six, and then less on question seven. And then by the end, just from repetition, we should know all of those rules uh, fairly solidly. So, see how much you can achieve in five minutes.
Okay, that was already five minutes. And again, you're going to get plenty of practice here, so I didn't expect you to knock all of these out right away in five minutes. If you did, that is great. But just trying to help you see and focus on um, what might be slowing you down. Okay, so when I asked my classes the other day, uh, last Friday, which part they thought was the easiest, quite a few actually said horizontal asymptotes. So since the degrees of these are equal, you should have said y equals leading coefficient over leading coefficient. So insanely quick and easy if you know the definition. Whereas I would probably say y-intercept would be the easiest. Plug in zero for all the x's and you get negative 6 over negative 12, which reduces to 1 half. These three are ones that I hope that you did since we reviewed those last class. But you can't answer those just instantly because you're going to have to factor the numerator So that you can see 2 and negative 3 make the numerator 0. You need to factor the denominator. And he has a GCF and a trinomial. Set that equal to 0. So negative 4 never equals 0. x plus 3 equals 0. And x plus 1 equals 0. Again, one nice thing about these questions when you have to find a little bit of everything is when you start to put this on a graph, and I don't know that I gave you enough time to do that on this question, but when you do, if you have something wrong, usually your graph looks very strange, things are not consistent, you can usually tell that something's off. But for this one, I've got only one number that makes just a denominator zero, so that's going to create the vertical spike, vertical asymptote. I've got one number that makes just the numerator 0. It's going to make the fraction equal 0, which is going to make y equal 0, which is how you get x-intercepts. And I've got one number that makes the numerator and denominator 0. So that would be the x value of the whole. Now as I pointed out to you when we did the notes earlier, the y value of the whole is one that I would put more attention to. <coughs> And it's just that you don't get to practice it very often. But you need to plug the x value of the whole not into the function. You're going to get 0 over 0. Not into the factored form. You're still going to get 0 over 0. You need to take the factored form and reduce it. Cancel out the x plus 3's with the x plus 3's. And then plug it into what you have left. So if I plug in negative 3 into the top, I get negative 5. And if I plug negative 3 into the bottom, I get 8. So negative 5 eighths. OK, slant asymptote is the one that's a pain. We have to do long division, but only if it has one. And that's only if the numerator has a degree one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So that's pretty quick. And then if we take all this information, realize we have two points on our graph and two asymptotes and a hole. If we start putting all this on our graph, our graph is going to come together very quickly. Now, when you have a hole, um, that's where your graph is not hitting the function, but you still need to put it on your graph as an open circle. So at negative 3, negative 5 eighths, there should be a big open circle. You need to show the hole there. Remember, your calculator does not do a good job of showing the holes either. So even if you had a calculator, or like the ACT or something, we would not give it a calculator here because it does too much for you. But on the ACT, just be careful with that.
Okay, and then looks like it's ready to go because these two points are connected. I know it has to approach the horizontal asymptote on the left. Based on this direction, he's going up on the right side of the vertical asymptote, so down on the left side of the vertical asymptote. Even though it doesn't hit the hole, it's going to hit the points right before it and right after it. So that helps make sense with how it connects to this. And it not only approaches the horizontal asymptote on the far right, but it also has to approach it on the far left. Now, I would like you to go ahead and if you didn't have time to try the domain, go ahead and take a moment to try to put in the domain right now. Because this one can mess some people up, so I want to see if you fall into that trap or not. So what I'm concerned about is that you said this for the domain. Negative infinity to negative one, and then negative one to infinity. Why can this not be the domain? Right, so negative three also does not exist. Negative, right here, I'm saying negative three is part of the domain, but negative three cannot be part of the domain. So domain could care less whether it's a hole or a vertical asymptote, but any number that you're taking out, any number you cannot plug in, cannot be part of the domain. So we needed these x values, which would be negative infinity to negative three. Then we needed these x values, which would be negative three to negative one. And then we need these x values, which would be negative one to infinity. Negative one can't be part of the domain because of division by zero vertical asymptote, and negative three can't be part of the domain because it's division by zero, it's a whole. Domain can care less what it looks like, just that it can't be there. Okay, so as I said, these just get a little bit easier each time you do them. So question four, anything you want some clarification on? before we keep going. Okay, then if you've not started question five, let me give you this tip. There's a negative out front here. If I was you, I would move that negative up by the four so you don't lose it. Let me give you, uh, say, another five minutes, and you should feel just a tiny bit better than you did in question four, or get just a tiny bit quicker. Do the ones that are the easiest first, and then when you get to the ones you're stuck on, go back to the box on the front page for your notes to see if that gets you unstuck.
so there was five minutes so let me go ahead and share the answers pretty quickly and then I'll give you a chance to speak up so y intercept you try to plug in 0 for x and you get negative 4 over 0 but you can't divide by 0 so that means there is no y intercept x intercepts are going to be numbers that make just the numerator 0 but nothing makes the numerator 0 so that means there's no x intercepts Holes are going to be numbers that make the numerator and denominator equal to zero, but if nothing makes the numerator zero, then you can't have any holes. Vertical asymptotes are going to be numbers that make just the denominator equal to zero, which would be three and zero. So that's really the first thing, one of the few things you could put to your graph x equals 0 is an asymptote and x equals 3 is an asymptote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do domain. If you feel more comfortable doing that after you've got the graph then that's fine. But I can see the only two numbers I need to skip are 0, so skip 0, and 3, skip 3. Horizontal asymptote would be y equals 0, because the degree of the denominator is bigger. Slant asymptote would be long division, but I don't have to do that here because the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So before I move on to the graph part, any of that I'm going over too quickly that you want to talk about more? You okay with that? Get most of it? Okay. okay. The problem with this one is we have no points and only two asymptotes. So what you probably need to do, or not probably, you absolutely need to find some more points. So plug in something easy like maybe x equals 1. See that it comes out to be 2. I don't think that's enough points to graph my function yet, so I'm going to find more. If you have any doubt about whether you have enough points, then you probably don't have enough points. So I will try x equals 2. And I would see that I get positive 2 again. So same y value. So that helps, but I still feel like I need something else. So I don't know, maybe I need something over here. I would maybe try negative one. And you get positive one. Oh, one thing I didn't graph, which would help me here, is the horizontal asymptote. I really shouldn't put that there. Okay, and now I think I've got enough points. Again, more points, always better. The way your calculator graphs point or graphs is by plotting hundreds of points. So you can always do that for more confidence. But did you have a question? Um, how do you, how do you get, um, one for, for negative one? Uh, well, the function's negative four over x squared. So negative 1 times negative 1 would be positive 1. Minus 3 times x. So if x is negative 1, negative 3 times negative 1 becomes a positive 3. So negative 4 over 4. Would be negative 1. Thank you. Just an arithmetic mistake. And if I had kept on going there, I was about to continue and finish the graph, and I would have missed it. And what would have fixed it for me is if I had found another point I would have realized that something was wrong because my information would be inconsistent. Okay, the reason I think I have enough is because I know it has to approach the horizontal asymptote on the far left. Now I know the direction of the graph, so I know it goes down on the left side of this asymptote, so up on this side of the asymptote. I know it has to go through this point, and it's going down, but it must turn back around pretty quickly if it's got to hit this point. 
which means it's going up on this side of the asymptote, which means it's going down on this side of the asymptote. And just like the left side of the graph has to approach the horizontal asymptote, the right side of the graph has to approach the horizontal asymptote. Now normally what I'd have you guys do is I would insist that you graph each of these because sometimes looking at the graph helps you catch some of your mistakes. It doesn't help you uh, with the holes or the domain or stuff like that. But here's what this graph is supposed to look like according to my calculator. In fact, I'm going to change the window settings to match ours. And then it should look basically identical. So the correct answer, correct graph versus our graph. Pretty good fit. So obviously if uh, it had more vertical asymptotes, then that would give me a hint to try that. If it had some a y-intercept or x-intercepts and I thought there wasn't any, then I would know to check that. But usually the graph, if it's wrong, it gives you a hint about what you're doing incorrectly. Okay, so questions six and seven. Um, I'm going to do less of guided practice here, but let me give you some time to try question six. And while you do that, I'm going to put the graph of it up on the board so that you can check as you finish. But as you finish, go ahead and start moving on at your own pace. And if you get completely stuck, just be ready to ask that question here in a bit. So I'll give you more time to do these now because I want you to actually stick with them and refer to your notes as much as you need to. But this is what your graph should look like for question six when you're done. If it doesn't look like that, then don't move on. But if it does, then move on to question seven. Don't wait for us.
so that was about six minutes. So for this question six, based on the graph, to give you a hint on which parts you might be missing, is there any parts of number six you'd like me to work out with you? If for nothing else to double check. Let's do the same thing with number seven. So I will graph seven up on the board for you. And that should give you something to aim for on your graph. And then we can go over whatever parts you'll need to or the whole thing if you need to. Just make sure that you're making progress on these questions. And by progress, I mean you're more confident, you're working them quicker, and or you're referring to the notes on the front page list. Any combination of that is progress.
Okay, I think this was number six. Seven. Number seven, yeah. All right, uh, questions you'd like to go over from part seven, number seven, to help you get that graph? think the horizontal asymptote is? Okay, so one thing that you can do, you can't graph vertical lines, but if you have a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote in a calculator, you could also graph it, and I agree with you, I think it should be y equals negative one half, but then you can kind of see that it's approaching those on the right and the left. So what were you saying about this part? Okay. Well, x equals two is at negative three fifths. Okay. It could just be that then. Yeah, and then if you did three, it would be negative seven twelfths. Four would be negative four sevenths. But yeah, it should never get equal to negative one half or bigger than negative one half. It shouldn't cross this at the far right of the graph. Okay, other questions about seven? Then I would like you to do one more question, please, number eight. You got about five minutes of class, but if you don't finish that in class, then please just finish it for homework. But I will go ahead and put up the graph up here. So if you don't feel like you finish it in five minutes, you might just very, very lightly on your graph sketch what it's supposed to look like, so then you have a check um, when you go and finish this question during advisory or whatever. But if you, as long as you put in a good effort to question eight, you do not have to move on from that. We will go over more of these questions and have more class time on Thursday for this. So, of course, you're welcome to go past the eight, but there will be more class time, so don't feel like you have to.